Welcome everyone, I'm Jordan. It's great to worship with you today. If this is your first time here with us, we would love to get to know you. Please click on the I'm New button or click on the Connect With Us button on fbcwimberly.com. Also, feel free to reach out by email to scott at fbcwimberly.com. I hope you'll check out our website. You'll find out what's happening at FBC Wimberly and you'll find some great resources. Look on the Family Life tab for materials for kids, students, and families. Click on the Resources tab to find life group materials that go along with Pastor Scott's sermon series. Our life groups are meeting weekly and new ones are beginning. Wherever you are, I hope you are a part of one, or perhaps you'd like to begin a new one. Email groups at fbcwimberly.com for information. On our website, you'll also find daily scripture readings for your personal God time. We want to let you know that we will be having a drive through event celebrating the Christmas stories on campus on December 3rd, 4th, and 5th from 6 to 8 p.m. If you're in the area or if you need to take some vacation days, come and see us. We have many opportunities happening to reach others for Jesus, both locally and globally. Contact Scott Tidwell and find out how you can be a part of this life-changing work. All for Jesus, whatever it takes. That's scott at fbcwimberly.com. And just one more thing. Thank you for your faithful giving that supports the everyday work of this church and our work of ministry both locally and globally. You can give by clicking on the blue button on the top right corner of our home page or text ETERNITY to 73256. Now let's worship together. Before I spoke a word, you sing it over me. Heaven is so, so kind Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me And oh, the overwhelming never this love of God Oh, it chases me down Fights till I'm found in these The 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Yeah So, so good When I feel no worth You paid it all for me You have been so, so kind to me And oh, the overwhelming Never in reckless love God. Oh, it chases me down Fights till I'm found in these 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending reckless love Climb up, coming after me. The 
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. This is true for you. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't. There's no shadow you won't light up The mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down And lie you won't tear down Coming after me And oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Oh, it changes Till I'm found in these 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God
so good Every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, oh I will sing of the goodness of God Thanksgiving, it's more than an excuse to eat a big dinner and watch football. It's a season and a reason to reflect on all the blessings God has lavished on us. A thankful life is a rich life, and we have much to give thanks for. So be thankful, express, reflect, and celebrate. God's given us so many reasons. Let's give thanks and live a rich life all for Jesus. Well, welcome back. Scott Weatherford here again. Uh, this has been an incredible month so far, the month of November. A little chill in the air in Texas and maybe a lot. Of, if you're watching in Canada, maybe the first snow is on the ground and you're going, yeah, the white stuff is back. And I remember I moved to Canada. I was so excited to see snow. And then as I live there, I get less and less and less excited to see snow. And then last winter in Texas, we had the snow apocalypse. I called it Snowvid. And uh, so anyway, but it's that time of year when things are changing and things are developing. But it's the time of year to give thanks, to say, God, thank you for what you're doing and how you're doing it. There's an old song that back when I was a singer, I used to sing this song. It's called The Love of God. And there's a line that says, the love of God is greater still than tongue or pen can ever tell. It's just kind of a, a nice poetic line about the, the, well, the profundity of God's love. And it's a profound lyric. It's greater than we can really express. God's love is overwhelming. It's complete. It's consuming. And it's defining. Now, although we believe this intellectually, that God loves us, I think if you're like me, you struggle with the personally. And you think, um, well, yeah, God loves me. I know. He loves everybody but me. I'm a loser, and I need to do some things better in order for God to love me. And that is the classic lie of Satan. He loves to impugn God's goodness and his love and his mercy and his grace. And, and he can let you believe the lie that God loves everybody else but doesn't love you. And then you live in that insecurity and you live in that lie of trying to earn or trying to prove or trying to feel it. When love, the love of God is far more, far more complicated yet simplistic in the way God does love us. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Satan here because, y'all, we're in a spiritual battle first and foremost. We're created spiritual beings first and foremost. You are created to live forever, and you will live forever. This body will not live forever, but you will live forever. And so Satan wants you to go through this life shackled by some things. And here they are. First of all, he wants to be shackled by guilt. You know, the shoulda, coulda, wouldas, and I'm guilty over this or guilty over that. And all of us live with the the kind of the the yard dog barking at our souls about the things that we we shouldn't have done, the guilt that we feel. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Paul made that great claim in Romans eight, coming out of seven, when he talks about how sinful he is, and he says, "Hey, in Christ, there's no guilt. We're free." Wow, we're shackled then also. By shame. Shame and guilt hold hands, and they walk along the same path. When we feel guilty, we feel ashamed. When we feel, oh, we shouldn't have done that, then we're ashamed of what we've done. My mother used to say, Scott, shame on you. Shame on you. And really, I'm thinking about that from a mental health standpoint. She probably shouldn't be shame on me. She should have been saying, God's grace needs to grab hold of the reality that you're a little heathen and you need to get saved. Uh, that probably wouldn't have helped either. But it's that whole process of feeling the shame when there's no condemnation in, in Jesus and there's no guilt in Christ because we're in here. Maybe we should feel remorse that leads to repentance and repentance means changing our mind, but he doesn't want us to be shackled by shame. Listen to this. No one, Lord, she answered. Now this is about the woman caught in adultery. No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus said, go from now on 
Don't sin anymore. This woman was shamed publicly. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you. In fact, I'm going to give you the power to live a sin-free life. Not sin that your behaviors that you will never sin, but free from the shackles of sin that leads to shame and guilt. Now, I'm going to get really personal. Satan wants you shackled by bitterness and resentment. <clears throat> Many times as a believer, we could be shackled by bitterness willingly and resentment willingly because we feel justified to be bitter and resentful. And you know what that is? Crazy That's what it is. It's not helpful, but we almost celebrate our bitterness and our resentment. I've been a pastor for 40 years. I've been hurt by the church. What? Yeah. I bet you've been hurt by the church, quote unquote, too. And so you carry around your bitterness and your resentment as a badge of honor, and that's really literally, literally drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. It just doesn't work. And we're shackled by this. Listen to what Paul said. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, uh, anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you in Christ. <clears throat> Wait, what? That I don't need to wear my resentment and share my resentment and my bitterness like some kind of badge of I've been done wrong, but I should live free from guilt and shame and free from bitterness and resentment because of what Jesus has done. I give thanks, give thanks that he's freed me from these, these shackles. I could be shackled by insecurity. Listen to what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all. That means even you. He is greater than you are. You cannot out sin or out stupid God. Once you believe in him, he owns you as a son. He's accepted you as a daughter. He belonged to him and he's not going to let you go. Nothing in heaven or hell on earth will let you go from the grip of God's grace and love. It's permanent and you're secure. Jesus said that. My father's given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Oh, wow. I, I could go on. But the good news of the gospel is not only Jesus saved you from hell, he saved you, listen to me, from living like hell. Some of you just got offended. But you know what I'm saying. That he saved you from eternal destiny of hell and living in the hell of a life shackled by guilt, shame, bitterness, resentment, and insecurity. I heard one theologian say, God woos us like a lover and then loves us like a father. That can be a little creepy, but trying to describe how God has really cared for us and loves us and, and brings us to himself. Now, I discovered this. The greatest love I give to Tara is when I, that's my wife, and are my kids, Caleb and Kayla and John, my son-in-law and my two granddaughters, Ivy and Lily, when I give them security, they thrive. And love then, get this, love is a decision based on commitment. And commitment equates to security. And security is secured by words and actions. And that's how God loves us. So let's talk about that. And let's let the love of God penetrate our soul and we can give thanks for what he's done. Father, thank you for what you're going to say to us in this time. And I pray that you just continue to lavish your love on us and speak through me. Uh, let them hear what you need them to hear. I thank you for this crowd that's gathered online, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I just want to say quickly about you guys that are watching online. We love you. We care about you. We're investing in you, and we want to give you the content that builds your lives. And I encourage you to share this information with others. But let's dive into this. Let me read Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And not only that, not only has God given us a, a life that we can boast about and peace with him, not only that, we also boast in our afflictions. 
Because we know that the afflictions produce endurance, and endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. And this hope will not disappoint us. Now, this is where I got the sermon title for the love of God. But because God's love has been poured out on, into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Now, let's talk about God's love. God, first of all, he shows us his love in his presence. God is present with me. Now, how in the world did you come up with God's presence and God's love in this passage? Okay, so I'm going to go through something that I hope you'll, you'll remember. That you have to remember this, that God is always present. He's always present. Remember the disciples, there's, a, there's an account in the New Testament about the disciples. They're, they're getting in the boat and they're going across the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is asleep in the, in the boat. And he's the God of all creations is asleep in the boat and the storm is raging around him. Now, here the problem was the disciples didn't realize it was the God of all the ages, the God of creation, the God who made the heavens and the earth. They didn't realize that, that Jesus was the same God and he was asleep in the front of the boat. They should have been playing in the water, you know, swinging off the sails, diving and swimming, but they were all afraid of their life. And this is what happened. One day his disciples, he and his disciples got in the boat and he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and they were sailing, and as they were sailing, he fell asleep. Then a fierce windstorm came down the lake, and they were being swamped and were in danger. They came and woke him up and said, Master, Master, we're going to die. And they got up and re- he got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. So they ceased, and there was a calm, and he said to them, Where's your faith? Where's your faith? And they were fearful and amazed, asking one another, Who is this? That He commands the winds and the waves, and they obey him. He's God. And when God says, hey, you're going to the other side, guess where you're going? To the other side. When God says, hey, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he's never going to leave you or forsake you. When he said, I've loved you with an everlasting love, I've wooed you with tender kindness, what does that mean? He's always going to love you. His promises are permanent based on his love for us, and he builds that security through his presence. He's abiding. When I rest in the truth of God's presence, I then can, listen, relax in adversity. And that's what I pulled out of this passage that I realized when I'm secured in the love of God, <clears throat> I can face any kind of adversity that may come my way. God promises he'll never leave me or forsake me. Listen to this. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere men do to me? Now, it's interesting that the writer of Hebrews talked about money in this context because I can become more insecure when I lack financial resources and I become more dependent upon God. But can I relax when I have little? And the answer is I can relax when I have little. I can relax when I have much because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. He loves me with his presence. And I rest in that truth. He never will leave me or forsake me. You know, I have the temptation to believe the lies of Satan that um, I made God mad so he's going to punish me or God really doesn't care about me or the way that my life, this is the way my life is going to be from now on. Or I can boast about hardships because of security of God is with me and that he's working all things out for his glory and my good. I can shift my attitude by saying God is for me. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purposes, Romans 8, 28. The boasting comes from the reality that God is present with me. I am with Jesus. I am with Jesus. I had a chance to play golf at a very famous golf course up in North Dallas. And I went there, and it was owned by a guy named Ross Perot. And I was with one of Ross Perot's executive vice presidents. We walked into the golf course. I wasn't a member there. He was. I went into the locker room. I got shirt and shoes. 
They cleaned my clubs. I went into the bathroom. There was all kinds of cologne there and, and, and products for men. And I was with my friend, and he was with Ross. And I enjoyed a wonderful lunch. We had snacks at the turn. I played golf there because I was not there on my own. I was with my friend. Listen, I am with Jesus. Therefore, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me, that nothing can separate me from the love of God because I'm with Jesus. I'm held by his love in the presence of his love that he is with me. God shows me his love by developing my character. God loves me so much, he accepts me as I am, but he will not leave me where I am. He wants to develop my character. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about, okay, what are the various kinds of afflictions or adversities we undergo? And I made a quick list, and I said, we undergo relational adversity. And all of us, you know, we deal with things relationally. We deal with troubles with our spouse, with our kids, with our in-laws, with our neighbors, with our friends, with our coworkers. There's relationship adversity comes because people bring problems. Uh, people are often difficult. God says to love people, and sometimes it's hard to do. Uh, sometimes it's hard to love yourself that you, you feel conflicted relationally. But there's also the affliction physically. As you get older, your get up and go gets up and goes. Your knees start hurting, your hips start hurting. If something doesn't hurt, it's broken and it doesn't work. And it's just the affliction that comes along physically. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, you fall, you, your hip breaks and you fall. Most people say, well, they fell and they broke their hip. That's not what happened. Your hip broke and you fell. That's what happens. And so it's these disturbing things that happen to us physically. Your teeth fall out. Your hair falls out. Your, your joints hurt. I mean, I sound like a you know, jolly old fella here. But that's the truth. We undergo physical adversity. We undergo emotional adversity where we have doubt and discouragement and depression and anxiety. Uh, my precious wife, Tara, she teaches four-year-olds. And she's even talking about anxiety, anxiety with four-year-olds. What do they have to be anxious about? This world's a freaking mess. But there's anxiety that comes along with living a life that is emotional. Listen to me. The church has to tell the truth about depression and anxiety because those mental illnesses are something we need to address. It's not a sin to be sick, but it's sinful not to care for the sick. And we go through emotional distress. There's financial distress that you live from paycheck to paycheck. You, you live wondering where your next meal comes from or, or even if you're going to have a next meal. You worry, how are you going to take care of the future? And I realize that God is the God who's carried me to this place, and he'll carry from me this place to the next place, that he's faithful. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's seed beg for bread, the psalmist wrote. And then we have uh, imagined adversity. And, and maybe that's tied to emotional, but we, we borrow drama from other people. If you're on social media, and like most of you are right now, you're on Facebook, you're borrowing drama or trouble from others, and it's imagined it's not real. Not real. My mother used to say, Scott, don't borrow trouble. And you know what she was saying? Don't buy into the drama of everybody else. And that's borrowing trouble. <laughs> Tara and I have been watching shows, like seasons of shows, on Netflix, and we were watching this one particular show, and it had these teenagers, and I found myself praying for those teenagers on the television show, and it wasn't even real. And I thought, you are absolutely ridiculous. I looked at Terry and said, I'm going to pray for those children. They need, they need prayer. And it's just a fictional show. But I was borrowing trouble from Imagine Trouble. Now, y'all say, My Pastor God, you are definitely weird. Okay, that's settled. In this world, you will have trouble. But Jesus says this. He's overcome the world. I've told you that these things so you may know you may have peace and you will have suffering in this world. But be courageous. I've conquered the world. I've done it. It's done. The love of God then is with us in affliction. Adversity defines us and it refines us. Character grows best in the soul of adversity. God loves me so much that he's willing to use adversity to develop my character so I could become like him. James said it this way, Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Wow. 
Here's the last thing I want to say. God demonstrates his love for us by giving us the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. He says, not only, not only am I present with you, that I'm present in your adversity and, and working in your adversity, but I'm going to give you the gift of myself. You're not going to go through life by yourself. You're not going to go through life in your own power. You're going to go through life as a believer in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's called didymus power or dynamite power, explosive power, life-changing power, life-giving power through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the moment I accept Jesus as my Savior, the moment I get myself saved by giving into the woo of God and claiming Jesus as Lord by confessing with my mouth and believing in my heart, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside me. It's not some kind of metaphysical manifestation, mystical thing that happens after I trust Jesus. It happens at the moment I claim Jesus is mine because Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. If I'm waking, waiting for the second dose of the Holy Ghost, it means I've divided God into three separate persons with different modes of operation, and I've divided the triune God, and that's heresy. It's called modalism, by the way, if you want to know what it's called. Wow. So he comes to live with me. And see, this is the love of God. Get this. That when Paul said it's lavished on me, that's what he meant. It's lavished on me. Listen to what John wrote in his gospel. And this is Jesus saying it. I will ask the Father who will give me, who will give you another counselor who will be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you in a little while. The world will no longer see me, but you'll see me because I live. You live too. And now on that day, you'll know that I am the, I am the Father and you're in me and I am in you. But the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your, uh, not as the world gives you, do not let your heart be troubled or be fearful. Insecurity arises where we're not taught the truth about the indwelling spirit of God that he gives us through his love. Insecurity rises when we take the Holy Spirit and we don't see him as fully God and he's fully present in our life. And what does he do? He teaches us to remember, to understand, and to be moved by him. He prompts us and gives us his wooing and his words, and he moves in our life. And I realize I'm being thankful for God's love takes me deeper because God loves me so incredibly much. The love of God is greater still than tongue or pen can ever tell. Oh, he loves me with his presence. He loves me through adversity. And he loves me by giving me the Holy Spirit. Then I can live differently. So could you. And I pray that in this month of November, with a thankful heart, you say, God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your love that's demonstrated and indwelled and is permanent. Thank you, Jesus. I give thanks. Father, thank you for what we've seen and heard and felt today. And I pray, Father, that you'll help us take next steps spiritually, whether it's the step of trusting you as Savior, getting saved, that uh, folks that are listening can whisper this, Jesus, I'm yours. Thank you that you've died for me and rose again for me and forgiven me. And I'm going to live for you. I confess with my mouth what I'm believing in my heart. I'm being saved by you today, Jesus. And Father, those who are listening say, Lord, I'm going to continue to walk with you. We'll continue to let you grow and, and move and woo in my life. I'm going to become more like you, and I'm thankful for your love, your demonstrated, present love, your abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that we can learn to live all for you, King Jesus, and that there's none like you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. You're going to listen to a song, and you might want to sing along with it. I want to make a Thanksgiving offering to you. Uh, today, if you trusted Jesus and you prayed with me, let me send you a gift. Just go online and say, I've raised my hand and give us some and I, 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 give us some information. 
Pastor Scott Tidwell, our online campus pastor, will be there available. And let me send you a gift. I want to do that for you. Uh, it's not kind of some kind of shady thing, but I want to send you a Bible and I want to send you some next steps. So let's do that. If you're listening today, and maybe this is your first or second or third time, send us an email. We want to send you a Wimberley t-shirt. How about that? We got a bunch of them. We love to share with them. We also have some other hoot nanny we can send to you. And if you'd like to know more about that, you could just let us know. Shirts, hats, cups, t-shirts, journals, all the things we make available for people in our in-person gathering, we want to make it available for you as well. So take advantage of those things as well. And remember, we love you. We're dropping content all the time. Sign up for our shout out. You can do that on our webpage and stay in touch with us because we consider you a part of our family together all for Jesus. So listen and lean in and take those next steps. And remember, I love you. And I can't wait to see what God does for you all for Jesus. God bless you. See you soon. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built. My hope is built. Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ, the cornerstone, the weak made strong. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I'll rest on His unchanging and we allow and we honor God by keeping him in his rightful place on the throne of our hearts. He's the chief cornerstone in which we can build off of. Anchored in Jesus. Let's sing this. Make it personal. Declare this today. Christ alone. Come on. Christ alone. Cornerstone. The weak and made strong. And the Savior. 
Father's love Through the storm He is Lord Lord of all Thanks for watching The Gathering today. I'm Scott Tidwell. I'm the online pastor we really love having you as our online family. You know, thinking back before COVID, our online family was really our local people that were out of town for the weekend. But since COVID, our online family has just expanded on a typical Sunday. It's people in 24 states and in six different countries. So thanks for being part of our online family. We take great pride in our online family and we consider you part of our church family and we consider ourselves responsible for helping you in your walk so reach out if you need help this fall we would like to expand our online family to some group life so you may have some friends in your neighborhood that need to be watching with you or you may know some people get in a group it's a great way to have other believers where you can talk more about what happened during the week go a little deeper in the sermon material just share God's love and work. You may have a group that wants to get together and do service work in your community. Group life is a great way to do that. If you'd like to lead a group or be part of a group this fall, reach out and let me know. Thanks again for joining us today. We really do want to walk with you, so reach out, scott at fbcwimberly.com. Let me know you're there, and let me know how we can help you on your walk. Let's team together for the global glory of God. Thank you.